Welcome all to the plenary session of the IHTA seminar, Town and Country Perspectives from the Irish Historic Towns Atlas. We are delighted to have Professor Chris Dyer with us this evening as our plenary speaker on medieval towns, why we need to take account of the country. Our chair this evening is Professor Keith Lilly. Keith is an historical geographer who lectures in the School of Natural and Built Environment in Queen's University, Belfast. His research interests range from landscape history and archaeology to urban morphology to the history of cartography. And in 2018, he was awarded the Cuthbert Peak Award from the Royal Geographical Society for his contribution to geography. Keith is the chair of the Historic Towns Trust, which oversees the production of the British Historic Towns Atlas and is a board member of the International Commission for the History of Towns. In a moment, I will hand over to Mary Canning, President of the Royal Irish Academy, to officially open proceedings this evening. But before I do, may I tell you that your, or the cameras are off and mics are muted, but do please get involved during the session by using the webinar's interactive features. You can submit questions at any stage during the session and we encourage you to do so. To do this, you use the Q&A facility in the control panel. We are recording this seminar and we hope to share the link with you at a, at a later date. If you would like to tweet about the event, the hashtag is hashtag IHTA 2021. President Dr Mary Canning. Good evening. I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the plenary session for Town and Country Perspectives from the Irish Historic Towns Atlas. I am Mary Canning, President of the Royal Irish Academy. And in the Academy, we promote scholarship and promote awareness of how science and the humanities enrich our lives and benefit society. One of the ways in which we do this is through our own research projects and the Irish Historic Towns Atlas is one of six that are actively engaged in long-term research outputs in Irish history, cartography, digital archives and lexicography. The IHTA has been running its annual seminar since 2009 in Academy House, and though we would have filled the large meeting room on these occasions, it is nonetheless we are delighted to have had such an attendance each week, with over 1,000 people registered for this overall event. I am told that our audience is from the international to the local, and it includes colleagues from other European Atlas schemes, and Ireland is just one of 19 countries engaged in this comparative endeavour. Endeavor. We have researchers from history, geography, archaeology, architecture and art history, whose focus is on urban heritage. Professionals such as planners, librarians, archivists, and many more of us who have interest and curiosity about how our towns have been shaped through time. I've been following the seminar either live or through the recordings, which are available now via the RIA.ie website. I would like to thank on behalf of the Academy, the 13 speakers who have prepared papers and shared their knowledge so generously over the past month. The IHTA editorial board, many of whom were in directly involved in this seminar, Raymond Gillespie, Howard Clark, Michael Potterton, Angrid Sims, and recent editions Ruth McManus and Jonathan Wright. These make a huge contribution to the work of the Academy through the IHTA, as does cartography and managing editor Sarah Kirti and editorial assistants Jennifer Moore and Frank Cullen. I would like to thank this whole team for their ongoing commitment. In coordinating the production of the seminar over the past four weeks, particular thanks go to Jennifer, Sarah and Michael and Alan Jacob of the Academy's IT department. This seminar is part of an ongoing collaboration with the British Historic Towns Atlas Project and we are very grateful to have Professor Keith Lilly, Chair of the British Atlas Scheme, with us this evening to moderate this plenary lecture. I'm particularly delighted to welcome as our virtual guest and plenary speaker, Professor Chris Dyer, who is joining us from his home in Leicester. 
I hope that someday and in the not too distant future that we can greet you both in person in Academy House, Dawson Street, Dublin. For now, I will open proceedings and look forward to this, the final installment in what I am sure you will all agree has been a most illuminating and successful series. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President, uh, for that welcome and that introduction, um, Dr. Mary Canning. I'd also just like to take this opportunity, if I may, uh, to thank Sarah Geerty and Michael Potter and Jennifer Moore for all of their sterling work, as always, with the annual uh, seminar for, for the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, working with us uh, with the British Historic Towns Atlas, which, as um, Sarah mentioned, I have the privilege of being the chair of uh, currently. I think you'll all agree we've had a terrific programme over the past few weeks. Um, and one of the kind of common denominators, I suppose, throughout this programme has been comparisons. Um, comparisons between places and between times. We've moved through from the Viking Age, the high bono Norse, right the way through today to the 19th century. And of course, today, this evening, we're moving back in time again, and there's absolutely no harm in doing that. And I think it's all to be encouraged through this theme of town and country, which again, is in a sense, a kind of comparative uh, exercise, is it not? Thinking about similarities, differences, about what connects town and country. So I'm delighted to be here to be able to chair this uh, session this evening um, and also to be able to take this small opportunity now to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor Chris Dyer, who is um, the person really from a British perspective um, to be able to do this exercise for us of connecting town and country through his research. Uh, Chris is uh, Emeritus Professor of History at the Centre for English Local History at the University of Leicester. And uh, some of you will know Chris through his work as an urban historian, perhaps as an economic historian, a rural historian, a landscape historian, and even a field archaeologist, and I may even add a historical geographer. So a man of many talents and somebody who, through his research for many years now, has woven together for us town and country uh, for decades, actually, uh, and connecting town and country through his many publications. I've just got a little uh, snapshot here. For example, Standards of Living in the Late Middle Ages from uh, 1989, uh, Making the Living in the Middle Ages from 2002, um, 2007 here, Town and Country, uh, and then 2017, The Archaeology of the 11th Century. Some edited books there with Kate Giles and uh, Dawn Hadley with archaeologists. And I think that again is a hallmark of uh, Chris's research on town and country and his collaborative approach. So it's a real pleasure then that we have Chris with us. Um, in connecting town and country then, we're thinking here about connections perhaps between people and the commodities, um, about places, about what makes the rural rural and what makes the urban urban. And it's an artificial divide, as I'm sure Chris will um, tell us later on. And what we're um, learning through Chris's work is that uh, it's essential really to combine both town and country. It's an artificial divide and it's been perpetuated really by urban and rural historians alike for, for many decades, if not longer, actually. Um, and I like to always see that uh, Chris is um, always sort of drawing out from the localities which were, I think, formative for him, like me, a fellow Warwickshire person, although I have to say Chris is from the posh part and I'm not, uh, but uh, working with local studies in Warwickshire, particularly places like Stratford-upon-Avon and Shipston-on-Stour, um, as small towns, but small towns with big stories. And I think, again, that's a, a theme of Chris's work is he tells big stories about small places. Um, and I think we'll hear that this evening, as well as connecting town and countryside. Uh, he sent me his latest publication, actually, which I read with pleasure. Uh, and it, one, the final sentence actually struck a chord. And I want to read it out to you now, if I may. And I quote here then from Professor Chris Dyer's latest publication. Small towns were enmeshed uh, in, in the same interactions as their larger neighbours. Simple, they are not. And I think Chris is about to now open up some of that complexity for us between town and country. Thank you, Chris. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, everybody, uh, for your welcomes and for your introductions. 
I think I'd better get on, get on with my talk. I, I suppose I should begin by thanking you for inviting me. And could I congratulate the organisers for assembling such an interesting seminar? Uh, I've been watching and listening and I've learnt a lot and, and I, I, I will uh, read more as well as a result of the, of, of the papers I've heard. I realise, especially after the Eurovision Song Contest, that the UK is not much liked or admired outside its own shores. Uh, but I will persist today about uh, in talking about medieval towns, mainly in England, but emphasising European parallels, as I presume, as all sane and well-informed people do, that England was and is part of Europe. Most of my uh, talk will be about the later part of the Middle Ages. I, um, I, my, my, my focus will be on the 12th, 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. By way of introduction, I want to sketch out developments in thinking about this problem of town and country. In the mid 20th century, historians on the continent and in England believe that change in the Middle Ages was driven by a rural engine. Population growth expanded in the 11th, from the 11th to the 13th centuries. Land was exploited, perhaps excessively, and expansion eventually ended with a collapse in population and the abandonment of land and a period of recession. The presence of towns in that great scheme of expansion and contraction was acknowledged and indeed it was thought of course that uh, uh, town, the history of towns echoed the history of the countryside. Towns rose in the 12th and 13th centuries, they declined in the 14th and 15th. But in the eyes of the people who put forward this view, people like Poston in England or Duby in, uh, in France, the towns are a bit of a sideshow to that main story. Historians of towns have made uh, too much, had, had made in, in, the, in the past too much of the legal and constitutional matters uh, so as to make their subject uh, rather uh, lacking in, uh, in, in, in relevance and interest, I think. Um, as one goes through the 20th century. But urban studies revo revived enormously in, from the 1970s. Um, if you like, the rural, the, 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 the idea of the primacy of rural change was a, was a product of the 60s and was still going strong in the 70s. But during the 70s, urban studies revived and became interesting again. Towns were seen as social organisations, economic organisations. They had a cultural dimension. Urban geographers rediscovered town plans, which is why we've all got involved in the historic town atlas. Also in the, from the late 60s onwards, urban archaeologists had to respond to the destruction of evidence with the large with large scale and purposeful excavations in advance of the building of those dreadful office blocks that we all associate with town centers towns now because of these advances in history geography archaeology looked more exciting than the country with masses of previously neglected ev written evidence documents being discovered, with buildings being studied both below and ab above ground, um, uh, the wonderful environmental deposits with their, uh, uh, with their uh, 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 animal bones, their, um, their uh, botanical remains and so on, telling us a great deal about daily life in, 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 in the medieval environment. Um, we, we began to think about urban literature uh, and people began to exercise real imagination. This is particularly in this century and people start talking about the soundscape of towns. They see towns as, uh, they, they analyse towns as places with colour, 
places with smells which are distinctive. You know, we see all dimensions of urban life. As town studies developed, historians redefined them. The dry as dust constitutional approach dealt with cities, boroughs, borough status, burgage privileges, charters and laws. But people didn't live in constitutions. They lived in settlements, permanent, quite large settlements focused on trades, crafts and other non-agricultural occupations, school teachers, lawyers, doctors. Uh, Howard Clark in the first of these seminars said it very simply and clearly. Villages were mainly agricultural. Towns were places where uh, things were made and things were sold. Towns were uh, pursuing a variety of non-agricultural occupations. And it is that occupational uh, contrast which helps us to see the difference between town and country. Towns took on a role as the engine of change in the eyes of many uh, scholars. They looked like cosmopolitan melting pots where various peoples and cultures met. They were centers of education and learning. They were, a nice phrase, enterprise zones. They were centers for innovation. Could I have a second slide, please? But the rise of town studies has not overwhelmed rural history, and so the two can interact on more equal terms than used to be the case. This lecture reflects that healthy, balanced relationship between town, between town and country. There is no primacy for one against the other. You can see from my programme that I'm going to look at uh, five uh, themes. Uh, uh, first of all, the appearance of towns, the topography and planning compared with the countryside. Uh, at this vision of innovation, of change, of dynamic change, uh, which is sometimes attributed solely to towns, though you can find something like that in the countryside. Uh, I will look at the markets and hinterlands, the trading zone around uh, around uh, towns and I will look uh, then at human hinterlands defined in terms of migration and contacts, personal contacts between people who lived in towns and people who lived in the country. And then finally uh, I will look at lifestyle, culture and mentality. Now in each case I will look at both town and country. I will compare them and I'll see how they how they connected. Could we have the next slide, please? This is a 17th century map of a state map of a village in Warwickshire. In it's the village is called Ufton, uh, a, a, a small, not very important village, but uh, it, I'm showing it to you because it's a beautiful map and. Uh, it shows a planned village. You can see there's a, essentially a main street. There's a sort of road junction at the, at the top of the at the top of the map. So it's not north, so I won't call it north. Or the map isn't oriented that way. But anyway, at the top of the map, you can see a cluster of roads meeting and, uh, and that's the site of the church. But the main thing to focus on is that relatively straight main street with relatively equally sized uh, properties uh, front, uh, with houses fronting onto that street. It looks planned. Someone conceived it as a settlement. They put in the boundaries. They decided where the houses would be. They decided where the gardens or the plots uh, would, would uh, begin and end. Now this simple observation that many villages are planned is an absolute minefield of controversy. How old are these planned villages? People are now trying to push them back into the 8th century. 
Uh, some people would argue that the main period when these things appear is in the 10th century. Others uh, look at a longer chronology and think of them as forming in the 12th century. But everyone agrees that they are early medieval in origin. Um, it may be that there are more than one stage, a stage in planning. There may have been a process of nucleation of settlement and then uh, the, the, the people in that uh, cluster of houses were reorganised into a planned settlement. There's a wonderful uh, theory put forward that villages are strippy. They're made up of strips and uh, the uh, taken out of the fields and that uh, uh, the, the villages were not formed as a single moment, that they were uh, incremental, they were added to through time. Uh, and if you look at this uh, example here, you can see how the, the, the strips at the bottom, the, the, the houses and, and plots at the bottom could have been added on as the village expanded. So we don't know or we argue about when these things were done. We argue about the process by which they were planned. We argue about who planned them. Um, one theory has it, it's the state, the English state in the 10th century. Uh, other people assume that it's the lord of the manor. Other people say the villagers may have played a part. Um, there, there is no resolution of that of that argument. But it provides us with a point of comparison because, of course, towns are planned as well. Um, in fact, uh, towns tend to have streets with uh, houses along them and plot boundaries behind in a rather similar pattern. And there's exactly the same problem of time scale. We have towns of the 7th and 8th centuries. We have towns of the 10th, towns of the 12th and so on. I'm going to look at a 12th century town and the next slide will provide you with an aerial photograph of such a town. Here we are. Um, it, the giveaway as to where it is, is the, th the large theatre in the middle of the picture. This is Stratford-on-Avon, a town founded, as far as we can see, as a single planned entity in the year 1196 by the Lord of the place, the Bishop of Worcester, who laid out a grid imposed on an existing road system. You got to be able to see the Romans, the Roman road, the street, uh, which begins running along the bridge at the bottom of the picture in the foreground. And you can see that road curving around and then going straight through the town. That is the uh, that is the Roman road, the street that gives Stratford its name. Um, now. Planned towns were different from planned villages. Uh, the plots tended to be longer and narrower. Um, there were marketplaces. Uh, that street that I've pointed out to you uh, running through the town uh, from the bridge had is a very wide street and originally had a market uh, uh, place uh, running along. It was the main marketplace of, of the town. But you can see uh, other streets in running parallel to it because this is a grid, a grid plan. Again, something which is uh, found in towns, but not so often in the countryside. Towns had two story buildings from quite an early date and they were connected by important roads to uh, a wider territory than just the surrounding fields, uh, which helps to distinguish between the, the town's uh, place in the landscape and the village. And the village. Um, they had rather small territories attached to them. The average village has, what, two or three thousand acres attached to it, uh, full of fields and, and, and places for farming. Uh, uh, Stratford's territory was very small. It didn't need a lot of land because the people who lived in it and it had 
uh, nearly 2,000 inhabitants by 1300, 100 years after it was founded, uh, its inhabitants lived on trades and crafts, uh, uh, run from their shops and from their backyards. Uh, they were not involved in agriculture. So it illustrates very clearly that distinction that Howard Clark made between agricultural settlements and uh, places with diverse occupations. But having emphasised the differences in plan, uh, I should just say in my in, in dealing finally with plans that uh, I, I shouldn't exaggerate the differences because many towns are not laid out in a straightforward grid like this and in, in, in such a neat pattern. They are often have clustered plans with roads meeting together at a central point and villages uh, similar. It wasn't only towns that had marketplaces. Quite a number of villages also had markets. Some towns had extensive fields. Some towns had quite a strong investment in agriculture. So uh, Stratford is not uh, absolutely typical. It did. Stratford had a weak agricultural dimension. Some of them had a strong one. Towns, I should emphasise though, uh, depended on close relationships with the country. The problem with using an aerial photograph is that you can't actually see it in the, in the far distance. There was another very wide street called Rother Street. Now Rother means cattle and that was where the cattle market was held. You see it's on the edge of the town, easily reached from the countryside, where the country people could bring in their cattle to sell, put them into pens where they could be uh, assessed and, and uh, bargained over. So the, the town opens its door, if you like, to contact with the countryside because the cattle trade is an important dimension of its, uh, its function in relation to the surrounding, surrounding villages. The next slide shows another uh, uh, example of the same thing in a more scientific plan rather than a, um, a photograph. This is Lutterworth in Leicestershire. And uh, if you uh, look at the bottom of the slide, I fear you can't read it, but the bottom of the slide is a street going to left to right, which is called Woodmarket. And uh, in the case of Lutterworth, Stratford actually had a wood market as well, but Lutterworth's wood market is much clearer uh, in the plan. And uh, that street led towards Coventry and the Forest of Arden. And uh, it was from North Warwickshire that the timber and firewood that was used in, in South Leicestershire was uh, transported and people from many surrounding villages who were building houses would go to Lutterworth to buy their to buy their timber in in the wood market. Incidentally, Lutterworth has a much more irregular plan than the one at Stratford on Avon, and uh, you can see there are elements of a cluster bottom right uh, of the kind that I mentioned. It's not a single entity. It's obviously been planned in stages, and I'm sure Keith Lilly could spend uh, a day or so explaining all the different elements within this complex plan. Right, so I've, I've, I've looked at topography, I've looked at town planning, I've looked at uh, planned villages, and we've seen differences and also some similarities. Both town and country were producing planned settlements at roughly the same time. Now I want to turn to change and innovation. Towns lived from commerce um, and they uh, carried out manufacture within them and they sold the, the, the produce uh, from not just their own manufacturers, but ones that they brought in from outside. The towns, you could argue, are innovators because they're commercialising the countryside. However, if you go back to that 7th and 8th century period that I talked about earlier, when towns were few and small, you find there's quite a lot of exchange going on in the countryside. You find there are rural markets being held, particularly outside churches 
outside monastic churches. Um, you find coins um, uh, 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 being lost on at marketplaces and with clear evidence of rural commerce. So you can have commercial growth, commercial origins at least, uh, in a rural context. In the same way, the crafts, which later became concentrated in the towns, are being practiced in the countryside. You find a smith, for example, being employed by a lord's household or outside a monastery or at an estate centre. And um, these are the these are the locations where people can get specialist services of, of, a, of, a, of a skilled craftsman. People say that once towns got going from the, so shall we say, in larger numbers and larger populations from the 10th century onwards, they became centres of innovation, of invention. There was a lively, innovating atmosphere, it is said. Uh, and there are lots of examples that you can produce. One of them is the introduction of a new sort of loom for weaving, the horizontal loom. And this is associated with the uh, serious decline in rural cloth making and the rise of towns as cloth making centres. That happens in the 10th and 11th centuries. It happens to some extent in England, but of course it's much more intense in the Low Countries, in the towns of Flanders. I've put up this slide of a timber frame building from the countryside to allow me to talk to illustrate the point that timber framed buildings using uh, uh, well cut timbers and elaborate joints were developed in towns. Um, the study of the preserved timber in the waterfront along the Thames in London has allowed people to identify fragments of demolished buildings which reveal the sophistication of their construction. And this is in the 12th century. For the first time, people could build really stable two and three storey buildings because the frame was so well constructed and that spread to the countryside and I'm producing here an example, an important example, the oldest standing timber building in a uh, peasant building in England. This is a place called Cottingham, uh, it, the, 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 the timber timbers of which this cottage were built, this house was built, um, uh, was felled in 1262. We know that from uh, tree rings. Um, now the techniques that are being used by the carpenters of Cottingham and other parts of the countryside are influenced by the technical innovations made by the carpenters in the town. So there's an example of urban innovation in, 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 in a, an important technique. But I could produce other examples which show that there was technical innovation in the countryside. Everyone accepts that windmills were rural and windmills appear in the 12th century along the shores of the North Sea. Uh, there are, there's a competition between northern France, low countries and uh, England as to where the, the first windmills were built, but they are definitely a rural innovation um, involving highly skilled carpenters uh, using the very, very elaborate timber framing uh, to make a stable structure. Fulling mills, part of the process of cloth making, are also a 12th century invention and the earliest ones we know of are in the countryside. I could go on with other examples. Sometimes you can't really tell uh, because of the complexities of supply and demand uh, where the innovation began. But I mean, a very important development was again around the North Sea uh, was large scale fishing for herring and cod. 
and that was to satisfy the demand of the towns, of the urban consumers who developed a taste for fish. Uh, and that was supplied, obviously, from fishing villages, uh, from uh, coastal settlements, uh, which uh, uh, had to change their fishing methods, the scale of their fishing, to meet with this, this urban demand. A last point about urban and rural innovation. One of the great stories about towns, which everyone believes, was that capitalism was a product of the growth of towns. Who, the, who were the first capitalists? The answer is, of course, the great urban merchants, the people who traded in long distances, who brought spices from the East Mediterranean into, into Western Europe, uh, the people who practiced uh, financial subtleties like insure, marine insurance, or used bills of exchange, the precursors of paper money. Here we see profit-seeking uh, merchants developing new methods, new techniques to maximize the returns from their enterprise. Well, we've long known that merchants were not quite as innovative and as uh, uh, open to um, novelty as uh, first appears. Merchants were not really in favour of free trade, they were protectionist, they were monopolistic, and they were rather conservative. There's always that great joke about the merchant venturers of, uh, of London, who were so venturous that they went to Antwerp every year and sold their cloth, and that was about all that they did in the way of adventure. Um, anyway, th this is the, 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 the myth, if you like, of the, of the merchant capitalist. But in the countryside, in the late 14th, 15th centuries, you find farmers who are rural capitalists, agricultural capitalists, seeking out markets, introducing new techniques of production, enclosed, closing their land and so on. And also in the countryside, you find the people who organise cloth making, the rural clothiers. They often have connections with towns, but uh, their labour force is usually rural. Uh, and the, the weavers and the spinners and so on were employed uh, in an efficient way to, and, and uh, their products were used to supply an international market. Right. So I've disposed of the idea that I hope that innovation is confined to the towns, we should associate innovation with the towns. Uh, the countryside is capable of innovation as well. Markets and hinterlands now. Let's have a look at the, um, the, the way in which towns exercise their influence over the surrounding countryside. I suppose that the rich merchants who I've already mentioned are regarded as characteristic of the uh, of the town economy, um, who the people who are selling tapestries and armor and other luxury goods to uh, people who uh, Peter Spufford calls the princely courts. Um, these are not they don't have much to do with the countryside you might say they're you know these these town-based merchants people like Richard Whittington in in, in London or Francesco Dattini uh, the most famous of Italian merchants they were uh, dealing with very rich consumers they wouldn't have set out into the countryside very much but because but they are connected because of the wealth of the super consumers actually came, of course, from their rural estates. So there is a, quite a strong connection. And of course, the largest towns where the, uh, the great merchants lived um, still had to find their food and their fuel and so on. And uh, just as uh, um, work has been done on the supply of grain to London or for fish to Paris, so uh, 
uh, Murphy and Potterton have shown that the largest town in Ireland, Dublin, uh, was fed and provided with fuel by its surrounding countryside. Uh, and they've shown the, the, the radius within which um, that, uh, that uh, trade went on, in which the supply of Dublin was organised. Most towns are small, with 2,000 or less inhabitants, but they're important because they account for uh, almost a half of the urban population by the time we get to their maximum growth at the end of the 13th century. There were a few merchants in small towns. They were full of traders and artisans. Um, you couldn't buy silks or tapestries in a small town, but you could get fish, joints of meat, lengths of cloth, shoes, nails, horseshoes, useful things for country people. Most of these small towns had as least 20 different trades and crafts, 20 different trades and crafts, um, smiths, fishmongers, butchers, uh, weavers, and so on. So trade and manufacture was concentrated in towns. Country people made money by producing for sale. They, brought, they, they produced a surplus of grain if they could, but especially animals and animal products, wool and cheese. And by, on market day, peasants from the surrounding villages traveled into towns with carts of grain and hay, with pack horses, with sacks of corn on their back. Um, on foot, many of them women, uh, with baskets of poultry, eggs, fruit and vegetables from the gardens, which the women tended. Um, and having sold these things, having sold this produce, they were they needed to take some money back home with them to pay their rent or to pay their taxes, but they also spent money on in the town on clothes, on shoes, on ale, and all the other good things that the town made available. We can map the hinterlands of towns in various ways. Um, the next slide shows an institution which gives us an insight into a hinterland. Uh, we're back in Stratford-on-Avon and you're looking at the buildings of the um, uh, of the guild, the, the fraternity of uh, the Holy Cross, which was a very important uh, social, religious and uh, commercial institution within the, the town of, in the town of Stratford. And many peasants joined that fraternity. It obviously had most of its members were from within the town, but, uh, but peasants from villages within a 12 mile radius joined because it was useful to them, uh, that, they were, that, that it was useful to them to take part in religious services and so on, but it was also useful that, for them to make contact with their uh, town, the, the, the traders in the town, because they would be wanting to sell their produce and, and buy goods as well. It's a, it, it's a bit like the, um, uh, what's it called, the, um, uh, the Rotary Club in a modern, uh, in, in some modern towns where, where uh, uh, people can meet to do business and for social purposes. The next slide gives you a more scientific picture of the contacts between town and country uh, from the basis of the court records of the small town of Ulster, uh, in, uh, again in like Stratford Avon in Warwickshire. Um, each of those black spots represents a record of a country person, a villager, a peasant, um, who for some reason was in debt to an Ulster trader, or sometimes the other way around, uh, someone from the country felt that he was owed money by a townsman. And so uh, they brought their cases to the court and that helps us to locate the customers, if you like, of the town, the places uh, to which the townsmen, from, from which uh, the, the, the people who came into the town 
where they, where they originated. So you get Nicholas Cox in 1462, who had um, sold four bushels of barley and was owed two and sixpence for it. So he, the, the, the customer didn't pay. So uh, the, 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 the countryman, he's from a village called Cleve Prior, just to the south of, of Ulster, goes to the court to get redress, to get his money paid. And so we get that insight into the hinterland. And what I want you to notice about the hinterland is that it stretches out for about 10 miles. Um, and I've marked on the map a lot of roads. And of course, these are the ways in which the people get into that, that town. That, that's, that's, that's the means of communication with, with the villages. And I've also put onto the map the uh, rural landscapes, the woodland to the north, and the uh, champion country, the, the grain growing country to the south. And an important function of a town like Ulster was that it provided a point of contact between the pastoralists and the exploiters of the woods uh, in the north uh, with the grain growing villagers uh, who lived to the south. The, there was a complementarity to them. They could exchange goods through the market uh, with the help of the townspeople. Um, by the way, the, the south, the, 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 the villages to the south of Ulster were in, an, an, in the Vale of Evesham, uh, which was known as the Granary of Worcestershire. And I was very struck reading uh, uh, Jim Galloway's uh, essay about, about Droida, uh, how uh, you could say the same, I think, about the Boyne Valley with its uh, 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 grain, with its concentration on grain growing. Towns and customers were mainly dealing with local produce, though you also find that there are imports uh, and, and, and goods coming from, from further afield. Um, I now want to move on to human hinterlands um, and the next slide will provide an illustration of that same sort of map based not on court records which was the uh, the, the, the source for the Ulster map this is based on a list of the people of Chipping Camden in 1273 and each of those open circles represents the name, a place name, uh, which reveals the place of origin of the townsperson. So, for example, you have a, a, a person called Thomas de Upton. Thomas of Upton is one of the townspeople in 1273. And Upton was a village about three miles to the uh, east of Chipping Camden, presumably from which this man came from which he originated. So you can work out where people who made up the population of Camden in its early years, it was founded only about 1200, uh, by 1273, you can see where the, the population came from. And you see indeed the same sort of pattern. Um, villages within about 10 miles coming along the road system. The road system binds the country to the town and um, uh, I've also marked on this map again the rural landscape, the champion to the north, the wold, the Cotswolds, the upland uh, to the south. And you see that there are people coming from both sides, from both types of countryside. They're meeting, they're encountering one another and they're settling in the, in the town. I should say that the villages of origin of these people reveal that they are not poverty stricken migrants desperate for a job and, and, and moving uh, to the town as a release from misery. They, people like Thomas de Upton, I take it he was actually the son of one of the prosperous villagers of Upton and uh, we, know, we know quite a lot about Upton and uh, it seems very likely that he was um, uh, funded uh, by his father, uh, a prosperous peasant of Upton, and uh, that was how he was able to set himself up 
as a trader. I don't know what his job was, but as a trader in the in the town. So it's, uh, uh, the migration into the towns is for betterment. These are ambitious, well-informed, well-funded people uh, moving from town to country because they think they have better prospects in an urban economy. I'm running out of ta time, so I'm going to uh, speed up a little bit. I've talked about the um, uh, the the, um, the 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 movement of people into towns uh, to better themselves. I should say that there's a whole number of reasons as to why people move from country to town. They go to be employed as servants. A lot of young women go uh, to be employed as servants. They go as apprentices. They go to get married. Lots of uh, evidence of marriage between uh, country and town, as often, in fact, uh, the the woman is from the country and has probably worked as a servant in the town where she has met her future husband. People, country people go to the towns for education and that connection is perpetuated. The town country connection continues uh, after long after the migration has taken place. People stay in touch with their with their families back in the villages and you can see the 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 the, the, the contact between one and the other. I've come to my last you'll be relieved to hear I've come to my last section I'm talking about lifestyle culture and so on. Towns have a claim to be completely different from the country. They're governed differently. They have mayors and councils, guild merchants, they have co courts operating borough customs. They, on the continent, they are communes. In England, they're just communities, but uh, they do have this different and more elaborate system of self-government. They're socially mixed. They're ethnically mixed. They are places of intense activity. I want the next slide, please. This is a place of the opposite of intense activity when the photograph was taken. This is the marketplace of the Cotswold town of Stow on the Wold. It's apart from the cars, it's empty. Imagine it on a Thursday, market day. Every Thursday, hundreds of people flood in from the surrounding villages, from 40 villages around. Uh, around. Uh, they come in, they come with their produce, they set up stalls, they sell their grain, they sell their cattle. This is, you know, the town as the sort of centre of its region um, and a place of, uh, of, of, of major uh, exchange and, 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 and uh, contact between townspeople and country people, between one countryman and another. Towns needed regulation. Marketplaces needed to be policed. Towns were, town authorities were worried about uh, illegal profiteering. Uh, and so traders had to be kept in, kept from, for example, forestalling, which means buying the goods before it got to market so as to be able to push up the price. The marketplace was a public assembly where important announcements could be made. Um, so towns are busy, congested, lively places. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of drinking. There's some violence. Next one, please. But to be more positive about them, they're, they're places where there are concentrations of clergy and culture and literate people. Um, the, uh, the, I, I put up a slide here of the almshouse, the, the hospital of St John at, uh, at Sherbourne in Dorset, uh, a focus of that town's sense of community, its sense of civic pride, of providing uh, for the poor of the town a, a, a decent place uh, where, they could, uh, where they could be fed and, and sheltered, um, a place which cared for its, uh, for, for its community. Villages can't be compared with these vibrant places. 
but they're not the slow, sleepy, illiterate, boring places which they are, are sometimes imagined. Villagers migrated a great deal. The majority of the inhabitants of many villages were not born in the village. They had come there. Uh, so towns were not unique in having a, uh, this, this pull for migrants. You find aliens living in towns, migrants from uh, abroad. And uh, uh, there's an extraordinary uh, uh, record from the mid 15th century in England of these aliens scattered all over England, not just in towns, but in villages as well. A man like Thomas Kane, for example, an Irishman, lived in the village of Kempsey in Worcestershire. And his, the records are full of his activities. He was uh, uh, a, a peasant farmer like everyone else. And his, his animals strayed and he got into trouble and he brewed ale and so on. But he was uh, obviously a, a, an accepted member of, mem member of the community. And uh, in many other ways, you can say that villages were not as different as the uh, as first appears. They have a sense of the common good. They regulate trade to prevent uh, profiteering. Uh, they have a sense of, uh, of, of, of social cohesion. They club together to pay for the church, uh, to, to pay for the church building. Uh, they're not completely lacking in culture and, 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 and civilization. Um, they have a, a, a tradition of many villages have a tradition of drama, for example. The Robin Hood play is performed uh, every year, and actually at this time of year, at the time of the summer games. And, ta and country people were not accepting of the social order. You find that, uh, um, as Rodney Hilton said, uh, ta ta peasants were really rather more radical in their criticism of authorities than were the the, the townspeople. I've gone on for too long. I conclude, my conclusion is obvious. Town and country were different, but they were not totally separate. There were many resemblances. They belonged to the same society. They belonged to the same culture. They interacted to the advantage of both and they needed each other. Okay. Thank you ever so much, Chris. That was uh, fantastic, uh, really enjoyable. And you've shown us so much about how and why uh, why we need to take account of the country in our discussions of, of towns and countryside. In fact, I think what you've given us there is a very rich uh, analysis of the situation, giving us a, lots of examples, uh, as always you do, but also not losing sight of the bigger picture and the bigger questions as well. So, and I think, um, if there's one word which sort of seems to me to pull all this together, it's about interactions, um, different kinds of interactions, but interactions between townsfolk and country folk, uh, interactions between uh, the town itself as a physical environment and the countryside as a physical environment. And thinking about the connections uh, that are forged through those interactions culturally, materially, in all sorts of ways, economically, politically, socially, and so on and so forth, as we've been uh, looking at. So I think the other thing about interactions, which I think is important here and what you've brought out, are interactions between disciplines, actually, um, and just taking a step back and thinking about how you have approached this particular topic um, through the lens of landscape history, uh, through looking at social history, uh, through looking at maps, as well as text and documentary sources, aerial photographs. You know, this is a multi-method approach. It's different interactions, which we see here, being brought together, uh, disciplinary interactions, if you like. Um, you also emphasise interactions between this side of the Irish Sea, I am in Northern Ireland, uh, and your side of the Irish Sea, so to speak. And some nice examples there of those, and in the end there, about connections between um, Ireland and England in the Middle Ages. Um, and, you know, one of the purposes of these uh, annual seminars is to kind of celebrate, really, those connections and those parallels, those interactions, really, across the Irish Sea um, between, in this case of your, your uh, presentation, your lecture in England and here in Ireland. 
So interaction seems to me to be a very important uh, theme or thematic running through this. Now, I'm not going to spend the next 10 or 15 minutes, everyone will be pleased to hear, uh, giving, <laughs> giving, giving you a kind of uh, a gloss on this, but uh, I do want to invite questions. I see some questions are already uh, emerging in the uh, question and answer uh, part of the, uh, of the uh, platform here. Now, I'm going to keep a full eye on that, um, but it's just one or two things, if I may, just take chair's privilege uh, on this. Um, and pick out a couple of things which really struck a chord, apart from the minefield of controversy, which I absolutely agree with you on in terms of looking at urban forms and rural settlement forms as well. Um, but I think uh, the windmills really struck a chord with me, actually, um, in thinking about networks and connections there between places and innovations taking place in town and country uh, and the cultural connection. So it's not just the movement of of goods or bits of timber to Lutterworth, let's say, you know, it's about the movement of ideas. And those ideas might be innovative ideas. It might be ideas about other places. So I just wonder whether uh, it, one of my questions, Chris, would be maybe you could say a little bit about um, your thoughts about the transfer and the movement and the interaction through ideas. And there's one other um, question, really, which or issue, really, uh, which this raises. And it relates to the historiography you mentioned at the start of differentiating between town and country. And I think this actually has very, very deep roots. And one only has to turn to Gerald of Wales um, in the period that you're talking about here as well, of course. Um, and the way in which Gerald characterises, uses town and country to characterise cultural groups um, between the, the sort of more rustic rural types uh, versus the more cosmopolitan urban types. And I just wonder whether um, in the Middle Ages we can find other examples of that kind of division and how it's been really perpetuated by the historical records coming through the historiography until more recent times, as you've described, with this more sort of revisionist approach. So I'm going to give people a chance to come in with a few more questions, but maybe, Chris, um, just a point really about the cultural connections and a point about the uh, the origins of this division between town and country. Mm. Yes, Gerald of Wales is interesting because he he says that the Welsh don't know anything about towns. They all live in the woods and, and <laughs> have nothing to do with towns. And then proceeds to give a little narrative about um, the siege of Cardiff Castle, where he talks about the soldiers um, hiding in the streets of the town, you know, sort of denying, denying the uh, the uh, the claim that he's made. Um, but it's the idea, isn't it, that um, uh, towns are civ civilization. You know, the the the, the, the civilization, the word refers to the civic, the the, the city, and uh, um, there is this equation between urban urbanized societies. Um, which um, you know, are living at a, a different level from the the, the more uh, backward primitive societies, which are entirely rural. But of course, they're almost always myths. The the entirely rural societies are almost always mythological, uh, and the, you know they, they do indeed. They may not have you know settled towns, but they certainly will have trading contacts. And sometimes there's more trade going on in these. Um, you know these tribal societies than there is in, uh, in, in 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 settled ones. So yes, I, I, I take your point about the the, um, the the symbolism of the town and, and uh, the way in which it, it's associated with a whole lot of other things about uh, people's um, uh, level of civilization and complexity of society. Thanks. Thanks ever so much, Chris. That's great. And uh, maybe I can take this opportunity then. There have been a number of questions coming in, so um, I'd like to just run through some of these with you, if I may. Um, so um, I'm going to probably take them uh, in order, if that's OK, uh, in the order they've come in. So uh, I was trying to think if I could group some of these together. Um, so some of these will be on a similar sort of theme. Um, so there's a question here about the, uh, the, the plan, the early manuscript town plan. Um, that you showed near the start and whether mm. there is a particular date. I think you said 17th century, but maybe yes. one could come first. It's 1695, I think, 
there's a uh, there's a little bit of doubt actually as to its precise date because it's attached to a survey of 12 of 1672 but it's uh, uh, it looks as if the map was redrawn in the 1690s but it's a, a late 17th century uh, map and of course it isn't it isn't a town it is a village it is a it, it is a rural a rural settlement thank you for that yes it's interesting how those those early uh, maps actually often relate to textual surveys um, so um, we have now another question, which is about money. Um, had the people a problem with money liquidity or did they mostly deal in barter? Mm. This is a, uh, uh, well, it's a, this is a, co a complex question, but there's certainly money in circulation from the late 7th century onwards. And, you know, we know that this money was being used, it was being exchange you know we, we find it in in trading places in marketplaces and so on where people have dropped it uh, from that very early period and by the 13th 14th century there is a very high level of monetary circulation but there is never enough there is you know that there's always a difficulty of finding enough coins to hand over you know if you go and if you go to a one of these towns and buy a cow it costs six shillings you know no one has six shillings in their pocket you know that uh, you, you you haven't got that money to pay, to spend so what you do is that you arrive you bargain with the seller of the cow and you give him a penny earnest money to prove that you've made a bargain to you know reassure each other that a, that a, that a, a contract now exists and you then pay for that cow in instalments over uh, weeks and months. And of course, very often something goes wrong and the, you know, you, you pay four shillings and you can't find the next two. And there's a, a dispute then about the final payment. But it is, uh, there is a, a very great difficulty in, 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 in finding enough cash. And so there is a certain amount of barter. Um, but the interesting thing about the way money works is that although you may not have enough coins, you always reckon in money. You know, you, you value everything. Every object, every, every cow, every day's work has a price. You know, everyone knows what that is. And that is the basis for the exchange system. You know, so you can, uh, you can have a barter system, but you always know that you know, you 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 work for somebody. They give you give you corn. You buy a cow. They give you some cheese. You know, there's that sort of a, a relationship going on all the time, exchange. But at the end of the day, they know that X owes Y four and sixpence. You know, they they, they they've worked it all out in money, and so there is a a monetary basis, even if there isn't enough coin. Thanks, Chris. That's a great answer. Thanks ever so much. Um, I just want to note here, Kathy, who says uh, thank you for a wonderful series I've been attending from Sydney. I presume that's Sydney, Australia. Um, so great <laughs> to have you, here, Kathy. Um, the next question actually is um, is a similar kind of economic question, actually, Chris, from Fiona Slevin, um, which uh, relates to fares. So I'll read it out. It says any insight about the degree to which weekly or monthly fares or markets increased the commercial success of towns versus those that did not have large fares bringing in non non local commerce did you get that yes yes uh, i didn't <laughs> i didn't mention fares did i so that that's uh, the, 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 that's something i should have done i think the point is it's the weekly market which is the important occasion you know every town has to have a functioning weekly market and when that market faith fades fails in the you know, you find it in the 16th and 17th centuries you're told that a, a market is no longer held or it's not very well attended that's that really is that shows the town is in serious decline um the the uh, I, I showed you that picture of stow on the world marketplace you know imagine a thousand people in it that's that's a proper market and, and I'm sure that Stow on the World Market had a thousand people in it every Thursday uh, from 1100 till 1900. You know, it is a very successful market town. Um, 
Stow on the Wall did have a fair, but it wasn't very well attended. I, my memory is that the, ta the market, the fair was held on the 1st of August. Markets are annual. Um, and some of them get off the ground and become famous and attract traders from hundreds of miles away. Um, but many of them don't. The, 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 the fair is much less important, I think. It's, it's a great boost to a town if it can have a big fair, but it's not essential. The essential ingredient in its uh, uh, commercial success and its economic life is the weekly market. Great. And I guess the fair is that, again, quite has quite a broad hinterland. I mean, some fairs, as you say, were so mm. so well known. People would have been mm. traveling many, many, many miles, big distances for those. The next well, question is. Well, near near Stow on the Wall, there's a town called Winchcombe, which had a I, I forget now when its market day was, but it had a weekly market. But it also had a tremendously successful horse fair and it got a reputation as the place where you went to buy a horse. And do you know that uh, a couple of um, uh, officials from a manor in the eastern end of Kent, the eastern end of Kent, travelled to Winchcombe to buy horses? Can you imagine? I mean, it's a it's a 150 mile journey. <laughs> it must have taken them about three or four days to get there. Um, and uh, obviously, the Winchcombe horse market had well, had a tremendous reputation. That's great. And imagine those places that those people would have moved through from from East Kent all the way through to Winchcombe, you know, uh, that kind of distance and the sort of interactions again that they would have had along the way, those encounters yeah. between town and country. Um, there's a question here. I, I think we're moving towards the end of the questions. So this might be our, our last question um, where this is about uh, the uh, the more legal aspects, actually, Chris, where did the impetus to establish a common council or some kind of town assembly come from? Was it just what you did or did it come from royal or baronial expectation, for example? Yes, that's a, that's an interesting question. I suppose that the, 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 the sort of um, the idea of having a group of people to discuss matters and to make decisions um, is in a way to ensure efficiency of decision making. You know, then and therefore those pe people in authority are in favour of that because they don't want people to be grumbling and and uh, and and, uh, and 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 not uh, uh, obeying the, the 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 laws and so on. They, they they want people to be involved to feel that they've been engaged in the process of decision making and to have a council which in some ways representative of the community is an advantage from that point of view. But of course, the, the people themselves do want that. They do want to be, they want that sort of element of representation. And there's huge amounts of discontent over the, when councils become uh, oligarchic, when they we don't let new people in, uh, when they, they, they become uh, uh, partial and, and make decisions which are biased against uh, against the section of the population. You know, the, the the councils can be very controversial, but they are necessary for efficient and fair government because that's what uh, everyone wants. And and the 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 the, the, the authorities from above will be emphasising the efficiency, and the people from below will be wanting the fairness. And there are these borrowings, aren't there, of um, customs and uh, legal privileges, which again, I suppose, points to interactions as one place has one set of borough customs, then they may also actually be adopted by another place. Um, that was, so that's right, yes. Yeah. So what they, they, you know, the Bristol was ruled by the laws of London, or supposedly. But uh, could I just go back to the villages? I mean, after all, villages have courts, they have meetings, um, there is a collective dimension, a sort of representative dimension in the in the government of villages as well. They are they are they are they are not uh, dictatorships run by the Lord of the Manor. The Lord of the Manor consults with a court, with a jury of twelve people, um, and uh, they're, they're 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 better off people, of course, and they're all men. <laughs> it's a it's a biased uh, group, but it still can be said to. Uh, um, mean that uh, the the villagers were involved in in, in decision making and law making. 
So yes, there are parallels between town and country. Maybe the last question then here, if I'm just judging my, my list correctly, uh, is this one. Uh, it's a short one, uh, but it probably could be a long answer. How and when did shops impact on markets? Ah, now that is a complicated question because of course, <laughs> when, when a market took place, there were a whole lot of stalls, temporary stalls put up, and that's where the focus of trade would be. But the townspeople had shops. I mean, they they opened the the the, the ground floor room uh, that facing onto the street was often a shop. You know, a shoemaker would would be selling shoes from 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 his his well, as I say, his front room, as we would call it. Um, and that was that that would serve a, a, as a shop. So and that would open on market day and that would trade as well. So the 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 the, the, the towns, the townspeople who regularly were selling uh, benefited from the from from the market occasion as well. Those thousand people thronging Stowe on the world market were focused on the market stalls, but they would also go into the streets and they would see um, traders there. Um, and, and use them. So, so it, it it wasn't either or. It was both and, really. Terrific. So, well, thanks ever so much, Chris, um, for answering those questions in such a really interesting way. There's always so much more to learn. So, really enjoyed listening to those to those uh, responses there. And thank you to those posing those questions. It's very much appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I could end now by just saying formally thank you, uh, Chris, for that fantastic lecture finishing off for this year the annual seminar of the Irish Historic Towns Atlas uh, and uh, I'm delighted to to say as well that actually as part of your your repertoire uh, for many years you served with us on the British Historic Towns Atlas and maybe one day Stratford-upon-Avon I think could be a really excellent candidate for a British Historic Towns Atlas so we maybe look forward to that so um, <laughs> thank you Chris ever so much. I'm going to hand over now if I may to Michael Potterton uh, from uh, Maynooth University, who is on the board for the Irish Historic Towns Atlas. Over to you, Michael. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Keith, and thanks, Chris, for that fascinating paper. I've just been taking notes frantically right, left and centre. Uh, I've spent the last uh, 20 or 25 years reading lots of your books, and I was going to say this has brought two dimensions into three dimensions, but it's it's another type of two dimensions, but it certainly added a strand to what I had read about before, and that was fantastic. Um, so my name is Michael Potterton, and I'm honoured to be a board member of the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, and as such, it's my pleasure to close today's proceedings and indeed this year's IHTA seminar series after five really excellent sessions spanning the merry month of May and culminating in this evening's fascinating plenary presentation. On behalf of the co-organizers and fellow board members, I'd like to thank our outside broadcast producer Jennifer Moore, IT support specialist Alan Jacob and all 13 presenters, especially this evening's plenary speaker, Chris Dyer, Emeritus Professor of History at Leicester University. It really was a, a brilliant paper and very interesting to see the similarities between uh, Irish, the Irish experience uh, and that of our nearest neighbours across the sea. It's also a pleasure to thank our friend and colleague, Professor Keith Lilly, Chair of the Historic Towns Trust. The IHTA has for many years had a fruitful and symbiotic relationship uh, with Britain's Historic Towns Trust, and never more so than since Keith has been its chair. I'd also like to thank Dr. Mary Canning, President of the Royal Irish Academy, for her generous introductory remarks this evening and to publicly acknowledge the importance of Academy support for the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, a relationship that's now in its fifth decade and almost as old as myself. Personally, I'd like to thank uh, the IHTA's cartographic and managing editor, Sarah Geerty, for her tireless and diligent work for the project generally and for organising this seminar. Oh, and happy birthday, Sarah. Ordinarily, we would have been able to accommodate about 140 people at our annual seminar in Academy House in Dublin. But the silver lining to this year's unprecedented circumstances and this online format is that nobody had to leave the comfort of their own home and most of you could stay in your pajamas all day pressing pause on your laptop to go and get more popcorn and another beverage and maybe a pizza and heckling the speakers at will knowing that you couldn't be heard 
Of course, the other advantage to this format is that we had virtually a thousand people in attendance and a further 1200 have already watched the recordings live via the IHTA pages on the Royal Irish Academy website. I'm reliably informed that Raymond Gillespie and Brendan Scott have been trending all week and Howard Clark and Ruth Johnson have become become something of a YouTube sensation in the last three weeks. This year's format has also generated very many interesting questions and much discussion at the end of each session, as well as follow up emails and interaction on social media. The recording of the presentations and the questions and answers sessions and discussions will also assist my colleague Sarah and me when it comes to editing the proceedings of this year's seminar. We've already begun work on that book, which will be published within the next year. This book will be dedicated to our late friend and founding member of the IHTA, John Andrew, whose birthday would also have been today, although he was a little older than Sarah. It's a reflection of an increasing awareness of the importance through the ages of town country relations that a project whose very name identifies its focus explicitly as historic towns has this year chosen to shift that attention uh, of its annual seminar to the countryside. In addition, the IHTA's Dublin Suburbs series, showcased during today's lunchtime presentations, is further recognition of the importance of historic developments and activities beyond the walls, as it were. I think it's fair to say that the presentations of the last four Thursdays have demonstrated that for centuries, towns in Ireland have enjoyed close relationships of various kinds and qualities with their adjoining and more distant hinterlands, the latter being structured around zones of agricultural production, transport corridors such as river systems, shipping routes or railway lines, market relations, political influence and land ownership. It's this interaction and symbiosis that leads a town and country combination to develop as a distinct region with a recognizable economic, social and cultural profile. We've learned that town country relationships evolve and mature over many centuries, resulting in diverse and enduring links between urban streetscape and rural landscape. Over the past month, we've seen how these interactions can impact economy, politics, natural environment, material culture, settlement hierarchy and social geography. As centres of administration, education, entertainment, finance, healthcare, industry, justice, religion and trade, towns had to be supplied and sustained by a variety of hinterlands, providing food and fuel, labour, raw materials and customers for craft goods and imported wares as we've seen this evening. One of the features of the earlier papers in this month's seminar series was the inclusion of evidence from this country's ever growing corpus of archaeological knowledge. The impact of the Vikings and Hiberno Norse beyond the towns and emporia, for instance, is becoming clearer from this evidence, as well as closer analysis of place names. Archaeological research is being used increasingly in studies of provisioning networks and trade hinterlands. And as Professor Dyer so eloquently demonstrated this evening, urban rural interaction caused ideas and innovations to diffuse into the countryside and vice versa. And this can be traced in material culture such as coins and pottery and can be inferred in architectural, artistic and other signs of influence. Town country ties are like the spokes of a bicycle wheel. Without them, neither the bicycle, the town, or the tires, the hinterland, can function effectively. OK, so that analogy may need to be finessed just a little, but uh, hopefully we'll have it right by the time the book comes out. Did I mention there's going to be a book? Well, please do keep an eye out for it. Uh, if you've been interested in what you've heard over the last few weeks, and I'm sure you have, um, I think you should watch this space and keep, keep an eye out for the, the proceedings of this, uh, of this seminar series with a few additional papers uh, over the next few months. And so then to conclude, it simply remains for me to reiterate our sincere thanks to the backroom team, the speakers, tonight's plenary speaker, Professor Chris Dyer, Keith Lilly and our colleagues in the British Historic Towns Atlas and the Historic Towns Trust, Dr. Mary Canning of the Royal Irish Academy, and you, our faithful attendees, without whom we would have all been talking to a blank screen. Of course, at this late hour, that might well be what I'm doing here. And so I hope we will see you in person at our next seminar. In the meantime, let me thank you all once more and bid you all a good night. Thank you and goodbye.